Pastor Bickle. I understand, having pastored many years, uh, all about that. So I'm going to do my best and, and keep it right there as you've asked. And I can't say how thankful I am for this church and all the blessings of what God is doing here. I've been here several times. Uh, we love to visit the Haydens, love to visit the Hamiltons, uh, love your assistant pastor, uh, Craig Hartman, and his wife, Lori. We have a special relationship with them at Baptist World Mission that just means a lot to us. And and I know that you are doing here the very thing that uh, what we do in, at Baptist World Mission is all about. And you're concerned about the gospel. You're concerned about seeing churches planted. And you're actively involved in that. Each time I come, I just see as I look all around, it's a world that would be different for me uh, to operate in, the heart of the city. And I just rejoice to see that God's work thriving uh, right here uh, in Brooklyn. And so I praise the Lord for your ministry, your pastor, and the wonderful relationship we have. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15 uh, this morning. And I'm going to touch on a familiar passage, but... I'm going to focus on a, a one aspect of it that I pray that God would use to stir up our hearts about something that we are doing perhaps, but need to be reminded to do more and, and to re, be reminded of the importance of this. But let's read uh, Romans 10. We're going to read verses uh, 1 to 4, and then we're going to skip to verse 9 uh, and read down to verse 15. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And down to verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I'd like to focus our thoughts primarily uh, this afternoon on uh, that phrase, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Are feet really beautiful? <laughs> Typically... <laughs> feet are ugly, if we'd be honest from our perspective about it. Yet God says there are such a thing as beautiful feet. Feet are crucially important. We get that. They're important for movement, for work, for travel, for playing, for eating, for exercising, for running, and just plain walking. It's hard to get anywhere without them and without them being healthy. Someone once said, I complained that I had no shoes until I met a man that had no feet. So they are valuable. But are they beautiful? Really? We see beauty perhaps in baby's feet. Many have uh, taken imprints of the baby's feet one way or another, and you're going to save them forever. And we, uh, I think my folks had bronzed my baby. I don't know where they ever went, but there were bronzed baby booties, you know, and set aside. We're commemorating those beautiful feet at birth. We normally try to keep our feet covered for comfort and for protection. Some like sandals and some even enjoy the freedom of going barefoot. In fact, I recently at a, a meeting met 
a man with an Amish background. He was in his 80s, and he was a roofer. And others told me, and I asked him to see if it was true, that he liked to do roofing barefoot. I said, come on, how, how, how can you do that? The, the heat on a roof, the, the nails that would be all over the ground. I mean, how, there's no way. No, I do it. it's really the best way to do it. You get great traction. And I, I still have a hard time believing it, but he's a, he was an honest man, and he had many vouching for him. He did his roofing barefooted. But, you know, any way you use your feet, they tend to become sweaty, callous, dusty, dirty, dry, cracked, fungus, ingrown, toenails, stinky, pinched, twisted, swollen, infected, strained, and just sore. We enjoyed some fun with the Haydens at a park yesterday, and Gabe had to get us playing ball, and I was loving it. I used to love to play ball, and that was a long time ago, I'm finding it. I had a little bit of a sore ankle time. It was over with yesterday, but boy, we had fun. But are feet really beautiful? Perhaps that saying we've heard sometimes that beauty uh, is in the eye of the beholder has to apply here. Beauty is in fact in how we see the feet and how we use the feet. Now, Paul, when he's writing here, mentions in uh, verse 15, using this phrase, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. He's actually quoting a prophet. Anybody know which prophet it is? Isaiah. Isaiah 52, 7. And he's uh, quoting when I, Isaiah was saying, oh, how beautiful it is. When one would come and preach the gospel of peace, thinking, no doubt, in the realm of the prophecy where uh, God was going to put them in captivity for 70 years. And imagine being in that captivity for 70 years. And when the prophet would come and announce that God is coming and God's going to restore us to the land. Oh, how very, very special it would be. Uh, the sound of that voice of deliverance that's coming. Now, what is the deliverance for us? It obviously has to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul was speaking in here about his heart's desire. In fact, let's, let's go back uh, to that first uh, verse where it says, My brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he bears them record how they had a zeal for God, but that zeal was without knowledge. So he had a passion and he had a prayer. What's a passion, a heart's desire? It's something that we crave for. It's something that we care most about in life. There's a lot of things we get caring about in life. Some are very good things, things we ought to be caring about. But even good things that we ought to care, care about sometimes overtake the most important thing in our walk for God. And sometimes, frankly, we get to where we care about other things that we really ought not care about, but our lusts get going after things of this world, whether it be riches or you name it, and we just get craving those things. But Paul's heart desire had to do with that his people Israel would finally have their eyes open to see that they were sinners and needed the Savior and that the Messiah was Jesus Christ and he had come and died for their sin. And he wanted them to, uh, to have that knowledge and that salvation and that heart's desire became his prayer he cared enough about it that he took the time to ask god about it he trusted god enough to know that his prayer would be heard and that god would answer prayer and god's holy spirit would come and bring conviction on hearts and i have to wonder is our passion and, and our prayer like Paul's? His is a great example to us, and it ought to be a rebuke to us. It ought to be an encouragement to us that we too would have that same kind of a passion. Our nation is our nation, and it's in great need right now. 
And I'm convinced for all the trouble, all the struggles in our nation, that the most important thing that we need is to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly proclaimed, refused to be canceled, but to declare the gospel of Jesus so that this lost world, that doing all this stuff in their blindness could come to sight and see Christ and be saved. Now, here was the problem, verse 3. The problem was, first of all, their ignorance. Now, look at what he said. For they being, though they were zealous, it's great to be zealous for God, but they were not doing it according to knowledge. He says they were ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, sometimes we think of that word of ignorant as, as being a, a cut down or really trying to hurt somebody. I don't think that was uh, his intent here. He was just being descriptive and, and honest about it. They, they didn't know. To be ignorant is that you just don't know. They, they'd never heard and they needed to hear. How is the problem of ignorance resolved? Well, it's where they hear the truth. That's where they are willing to listen. And, and there it goes even from the head or from the ear into the brain and down to the heart. But they're no longer ignorant. But you know, they had another problem. And that second problem we find is that they went about to establish their own righteousness. I've called this problem pride. And again, they might have intended well, but they, in their pride thought, somehow they could establish their own righteousness. Now, they may have done that in part by uh, keeping the law or attempting to keep the law. But in reality, we learn that law is a schoolmaster. It's there for the purpose of teaching all of us that we can't keep the law. It's there so that we learn we really need help. We need somebody else to come in and fulfill the law and someone to forgive us of our sin because we can't do this on ourselves. You know, the Pharisees even took it beyond that. and They tried to establish their own righteousness outside of what God declared as righteous. All the things that they thought they could do so well. Look at me and I'm, I'm so religious. And, you know, we fall into that same temptation. You know, just doing all the right rituals or whatever is expected and, and thinking that it's that outward doing. So how does this pride get resolved? I believe it's through the conviction of the Holy Spirit that actually uses the law for its purpose. And we come to where we're seeing, I am a sinner and I need help. You know, there was a third problem they had, and it says that they have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. And I just call this their stubborn rebellion. Uh, did you go for a little while after you heard the gospel? To where you resisted? I did. Now there, I made about three professions when I was a kid that I allowed somebody to show me, and, and I prayed a prayer, I think. I wasn't quite sure after a while. I don't believe I truly got saved until I was uh, 14, just about to turn 15 the fall of that year, and it was at home. It was in bed. It was when the Spirit of God kept convicting and convincing. But for the longest time, I resisted. I'm already saved. That's okay. Everybody that thinks I'm saved, they'll wonder what on earth's going on. They, they probably knew what was going on, <laughs> and that I really wasn't displaying the fruit of salvation. But if I really got saved, I'd have to change the way I'm living. And all my friends at public school, they would make fun of me that I had all the excuses and resisted. And I think, too, God's people were doing that kind of thing. We have that same stubborn rebellion. And that's, that's solved when finally we just yield to the working of the Spirit of God. But well, God's provided the way of salvation, and we find it described in verses 9 to 13. We won't take the time other than just reference verse 13. The simplicity of the gospel, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then we get back really to the, the thrust I wanted to leave us with today. And people aren't going to call unless they believe. And they're not going to believe unless they've at least heard. But they're never going to hear unless there's a preacher. And oh, today don't we need more God-called preachers to give their life to the purpose of declaring the gospel and taking it 
to another area, another people group. Praise the Lord for the Haydens and the work with Russian-speaking people. Praise the Lord for the Hamiltons and the work that God's going on uh, doing up there in the Bronx. And I last communication with him, I was telling him how encouraged I was and how encouraged they must be. And he wrote back and he said, we're not just encouraged, we're excited about what God's doing. But you know, they, they went through a bit of a dry, difficult time there for a while and God's doing some fresh things. Praise the Lord for those that are giving their lives, using their feet for the purpose of preaching the gospel. Friend, would you consider using your feet why did he say, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace? Because that's one of the greatest things anybody could do. You know, we all can do that. Doesn't matter whether you're called full-time into ministry or not, but, you know, for some, God wants us to use our feet for that very purpose. You know, feet, as I mentioned, do tend to be ugly, but I, when you start seeing them in the right light, it makes a big difference. My folks, uh, about, a, about a year ago, moved them up to Madison, Alabama, out of Florida, where they were to be in assisted living. And long story, very short, my mother ended up a few months ago starting to fail dramatically, and, and she died on May 30th, and we buried her here in New York, in uh, Corning, New York. Uh, on June 8th, but in those latter days for mom, one of the, she had dementia that got really bad, and a part of that, she had these legs that got this elephantitis, and uh, I mean, it got really ugly, swollen to red to dry to cracked to fish scale-like, and pain eventually came that caused so much, it, it was painful for dad and I. I remember different nights, we'd be one on one side of the bed and one on the other, praying and crying out to God to heal her and give her relief. But I'd look at these legs and these feet and my eyes began to see them beautifully. As I remembered a 20 year old mom who brought her son into the world. And the life that I remember of her and all the sacrifices, all the things that she did for this little guy. And I saw her feet that were the probably the ugliest feet that I'd ever seen. I said, they're beautiful. She got me at church and she prayed for me and she encouraged this young preacher. And I praise God for her feet because it's how she used her life. Jesus said to his disciples, behold, my hands and my feet. Nail scarred. But are they not beautiful to the believer? My friends, I know you know all this, and I know you're busy about it. But I also know that sometimes it's out of those churches where God is doing something special in the hearts of young people and in the hearts of adults alike to call them out to do something special in a different place that another borough in New York would have a church like Bethel Baptist Fellowship. And whatever God might be doing, I pray that God might bring your heart to be yielded and surrendered to him today.